everyone. It's Darren DeVivo, and welcome to uh, another edition of Things We Said Today, a Beatles podcast where we discuss everything and anything under the sun regarding the Beatles together and solo. Talk about the music. We talk about various anniversaries. We talk about uh, our favorite band's impact on our personal lives and whatnot. Anything goes on this show, within reason, of course. It's Things we said today and i'm darren devivo and i'm joined by my co-hosts uh it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce to you a guy who has been hosting beatles radio programs since 1982 and his current program every little thing is now in syndication and uh, to show the features of course lots of music but also news and trivia and there's prizes involved and themes as well in addition to every little thing, and later on in the show, he can tell you about the who, what, why, and where of uh, every little thing. In addition to the radio show, he's also the co-host of the solo Beatles video cast, Talk More Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Ken Michaels. Thank you, Darren. That's quite an introduction there. <laughs> That's... <laughs> I'm playing and, to an audience of one. That's it. <laughs> and uh, also joining me and joining Ken. He's been under the weather, but like a warrior, he's with us now with cough drops in hand. Uh, <laughs> you know him as a longtime music critic for the New York Times, four decades writing not only about popular music, but also classical music, very much uh, uh, one of his uh, areas of expertise. So uh, let's say roughly 40 years of doing that and an author as well. Some of the books he's written include The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And now he pops up here and there uh, writing for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, to name two, working on a book on Paul McCartney as we speak. Not this second, because he's here talking with us now. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Cozen. Hello, everyone. Hello, Darren. Hello, Ken. Hi. And hey, as, Alan. For me, <laughs> as for me, they found me uh, outside their front door one of these uh, one day and asked me to come on in and put me on the show. No, I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV in New York City. And this is Things We Said Today. And uh, today's show, we are going to uh, take a look at Yoko Ono. And her importance to John Lennon, her role in Lennon's life, and how she influenced John. Uh, some thoughts that we might have about her impact on the Beatles and on the art world. We just passed her 87th birthday on February 18th. Yoko was born in Tokyo in 1933. She's 87 years young. And uh, we decided to have a show where we dedicate most of the show to Yoko Ono. So that will be today. And in addition to that, as we record this show, we are celebrating what would have been George Harrison's 77th birthday. Now, this program is being recorded on the 24th of February for many, many, many years. We celebrated George's birthday on the 25th of February. But by some late in life discovery, confusion over when exactly George was born, there's some evidence that he might have been born before midnight on the 24th. So the way I look at it, I celebrate his birthday for 48 hours, and we're going to uh, uh, spend a few minutes just looking at uh, his music, and each one of us will pick what uh, is our go-to album for George, of George Harrison's. But first, before we get into our conversation about Yoko Ono, Ken Michaels has the latest in Beatle news. Thank you, Darren. I like that. Celebrating George's birthday two days. Very clever. Yeah, yeah. 48 hours of parties. <laughs> well, we have a couple of weeks uh, to catch up on here. Uh, news broke last week about a documentary in the works on Paul McCartney that will span his entire career, The Beatles' Wings and his solo works. This documentary has actually been 12 years in the making, and it will culminate in Paul's live performance at the Glastonbury Festival this June, which will be captured by filmmaker Charlie Lightning, 
who won an NME award a couple weeks ago for a documentary he worked on for Liam Gallagher. Lightning is quoted as saying, he, meaning Paul, he's helped me with what I do and I adore him. He's trusted me and to have someone like that to see up close and work with, that's inspiring. It makes you better at what you are. It makes you want to be better. The film will include interviews with Paul and so far there is no set release date yet. That's kind of interesting that this has been in the works now for 12 years. Didn't know about it till now. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, Paul and wife Nancy were enjoying themselves while seeing the Eagles in concert at New York's Madison Square Garden a couple of weeks ago. They were on the floor front row with a very animated Paul cheering them on. And actually, Darren, you should be the one talking about this because on our last show, we were uh, bringing up the new deal that uh, the Harrison estate had with BMG. Uh-huh. And yes. we brought up the questions about whether or not all of the Dark Horse catalog will be strictly digital and whether or not it will involve any of George's own solo music. Would you uh, like to shed some light on that since you found out some information about it? I found out some information. It's in one of these instances where, not to be negative, but I'll believe it when I actually see that this happens. But from what I was told, down the line, whatever that means, it could be within months or maybe later in the year or, or at some point, I'm not sure. The releases that are available at the moment digitally will be available in a phys- physical format. And I didn't get any indication that any future Dark Horse releases, whether they're new or reissues, are going to be limited to uh, being just digital releases. So it was a little bit of information I picked up. Uh, Not all that much, um, but I did get the impression that the things that are available now digitally, for example, the albums from the late Joe Strummer and his band, The Mescaleros, interestingly, somehow are involved in this. Somehow Dark Horse now has the rights to those releases. Those, uh, I anticipate, will be also coming out, you know, in physical formats. In addition to that, George Harrison's titles, which are on Dark Horse Capital now, uh, those are the uh, 76 to Brainwashed releases, those are actually going to remain under the Universal umbrella. So even though Dark Horse has a new deal with BMG, the Dark Horse titles of George's uh, will remain uh, with Capital Universal. So they're not going to be part of any new BMG reissues, at least nothing that I was told. Mm. Okay, so not to expect anything unreleased from George's solo catalog. And if we do get anything, it'll be at the Universal. Well, then, of course, if stranger things have happened. You got to wonder if anything that's released from this point on in 2020 perhaps might fall under BMG's umbrella. I don't know, but what's been out there, what's out there already is staying with Universal, the capital, you know, the Dark Horse capital reissues. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that information, Darren. And uh, in other news, this is going back a few weeks now at the Oscars. Billie Eilish sang the Beatle classic song yesterday while they presented their in-memoriam tribute to those in the entertainment industry who we lost in the past year. Billie Eilish apparently is a big Beatles fan. At an early age, she performed on stage with her father the song Happiness is a Warm Gun in a school competition. When she was on James Corden's show, she performed a brief version of I Will on ukulele. And in an interview from last April, Eilish said, I think if you listen to my music and what I create and what me and my brother create together, there's so much Beatles inspiration in there if you really listen for it. Just because their lyrics and their harmonies are unbelievable, they're so nice to your ear, they just feel good to listen to. End of quote there. The Beatles were, in fact, represented in some of the movies nominated for Best Picture of the Year. Marriage Story had Sgt. Pepper outfits shown in one of the final scenes. And Jojo Rabbit actually used the Beatles recording of Come Gimme Dinah Hand (laughs) in the film. And it's even included in the soundtrack album, which is a rare thing, seeing a Beatles recording used in a soundtrack (laughs) and on a soundtrack release. 
Mm. Except for With Nail and I, of course, but that was a handmade film, so they had an in. <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, Let It Be was in the Vietnam War soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it does happen once in a while, but rarely. Very often, Record Store Day has releases for Beatle fans. And uh, Steve Hoffman's board is saying that there will be a limited edition 2020 ultimate remix from the original multi-track tapes for John's classic Instant Karma coming out. Hmm. And that'll be on April the 18th. I haven't seen a complete list of Record Store Day releases, but that's the only one that's on there so far for Beatle fans. Somebody I heard a hint at uh, the Kink Chronicles compilation album from the Kinks will hmm. be getting reissued. I don't know if that's true or not, but they haven't released the complete list yet. So it's all speculation at this point. But I saw the same thing you did about Instant Karma. That sounds like that is reality, going to be okay. reality. All right. More news. Lawrence Juber has just released his fourth CD of acoustic guitar covers of Beatles songs. This one is called The Fab Fourth. The (laughs) CD includes 16 Beatles songs, one of which is a bonus track on the CD. All beautifully mastered, as always, by Lawrence on the acoustic. And Lawrence will be a special guest at the upcoming Fest for Beatles fans. Four CDs now of Beatles covers. Plus, he did one on uh, just Wings covers called One Wing. A while back, we reported on a new album coming from former lead singer for Styx, Dennis DeYoung, called 26 East, Volume 1, which will have Julian Lennon making an appearance on it. The album comes out April 10th, but a two-sided single will be released in March. Julian's duet with Dennis will be the A-side, and it's called To the Good Old Days. All right, and uh, the band called The Empty Hearts is one many Beatle fans are aware of, or should be. Uh, the quartet is made up of Elliot Easton of The Cars, Wally Palmer of The Romantics. He was also in Ringo's All-Stars for a while. Clem Burke, the drummer for Blondie. And Andy Babuik, who is also known for being one of the authors of Beatles Gear. And on Valentine's Day, they released a new single, very 60s sounding, called Remember Days Like These. And what do you know? They got Ringo to drum on it. And this song is currently available digitally. Remember Days Like These from the Empty Hearts. Thanks to one of our listeners, Bob Keeley, there's a new cover version of John Lennon's Oh My Love being sung by French soprano soloist uh, Patricia Pettibon on her new album L'Amour, La Morte, La Mer. And that was released on the Sony Classical label. Do you know anything about her, Alan? Because she she does sing classical music and opera, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's good. I mean, I, I don't I don't have a lot to say about her, but um, but she's been around, and uh, so I guess this is a crossover project for her. Yeah, no, I've listened to it. You can actually go on YouTube and check it out. Mm-hmm. Oh, my love from Patricia Pettibon, P E T I B O N. And finally, for many years, we've had a Beatles festival held in this country called Abbey Road on the River, with Beatles tribute acts from around the world performing at the show, as well as special guests appearing. This year, for the first time ever, they will stage an additional show, and it'll be on Long Island, calling it Abbey Road on the Island. (laughs) It'll take place on Labor Day weekend, September 4th through the 6th at the Tilly Center at Long Island University in Brookville. And there will be headlining acts such as Peter Asher, Lawrence Juber, The Weaklings, and the tribute band The Fab Four. Tickets go on sale on February the 28th. And if you need more information, you can visit their website, which is abbeyroadontheisland.com. Abbey Road on the River will have their festival at Big Four Station Park in Jeffersonville, Indiana. That's May the 20th through the 25th. And you can visit their website for that. Just spell out the first letters of each word, A-R-O-T-R dot com for that. Okay, that is it for Beatle News. And that was all the news that's fit to sing. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's Ono News. That's oh, fit very to nice. <laughs> very good. 
Okay. <laughs> Uh, and that was I, that I was very this, spontaneous on my part. No preparation whatsoever. <laughs> I know that this is a Beatles show, but I always want to like play ELO's Here is the News going into that segment every week, every, <laughs> you know, show. But um, anyway, so um, our topic today is Yoko Ono. Uh, Yoko just celebrated her uh, 87th birthday uh, on February 18th. Born in Tokyo, February 18th, 1933. Yoko needs no introduction from, from any of us. Yoko is an individual who is an enormously talented artist. We know that. Also rather controversial, especially in the eyes of uh, many Beatle fans and John Lennon enthusiasts. And uh, mentioning Yoko on, for example, a forum like Facebook uh, is going to... Um, end up resulting in a variety of different responses, including those that are very, very positive and very pro-Yoko and those that are very anti-Yoko. And with Yoko having just celebrated her birthday, we decided that we would just talk about her, her role uh, in, in John's life and how we all thought she uh, influenced John and, uh, and indirectly as a result of that or maybe directly influence the Beatles and uh, what we feel her place is in, uh, you know, in the art world, in the music world and in culture uh, today. So um, I guess we'll go in alphabetical order and begin <laughs> the conversation by getting the thoughts of, of Alan uh, <laughs> on, and, and take basically the conversation, Alan, in any direction you wanted to. Okay. In, in trying to basically give your views of Yoko Ono, the person, the artist, and uh, Mrs. Lennon. Okay. You know, I've interviewed Yoko a, a number of times over the years, and, uh, uh, you know, I've always found her kind of, you know, funny and charming and, and, and really nice. I mean, this is recognizing that when you would turn up to interview someone for the New York Times, they're going to be behaving in a certain way, and that... Yoko dealing with me isn't necessarily the same as Yoko as she deals with, let's say, an employee or whatever. But um, but that's the same for everybody. That's not just Yoko. I think, you know, I, I recently got into a conversation online with someone who who actually had been in a Yoko fight elsewhere on another forum and was asking me some questions. And one of his questions based on the conversation he was having is, you know, was Yoko really a pianist? You know, was she really trained as a classical pianist? And because, uh, I don't know, there, you know, you don't see her play keyboard that much. She doesn't play keyboard on her albums. And people say that at the, one-to-one -one concert or keyboard was unplugged and blah, blah, blah. You know, Yoko has actual classical music training. I mean, her father wanted to be a pianist and was unable for various reasons, ended up being a banker. And, and, and so he had sent, he had enrolled Yoko in a pretty elite music school in Tokyo when she was a kid. And then when she finally came to the U.S. and enrolled at uh, Sarah Lawrence, uh, that was also as a music student. And, you know, you don't get into these places without any evidence of talent. You know, um, she, I, you know, I, I haven't heard her play the Moonlight Sonatas. You know, she supposedly did backwards for, um, you know, John to get the chords for Because. But, you know, I don't doubt that she could play it. And uh, I think that the conversation that this guy was in was just, you know, it, it, he was just dealing with a lot of people who are in that extremely negative Yoko camp, the existence of which I don't really understand at this point in history. You know, it's it's like oh. a long time ago. If you want to blame Be Yoko for breaking up the Beatles, I mean, every single one of them has said that it wasn't her. Uh, on the other hand, you know, okay, John bringing Yoko into sessions might have been a little disruptive to a group that didn't typically bring wives and girlfriends into sessions, but, uh, you know, they got on with it. You know, Abbey Road was made with Yoko sitting there the whole time. 
let it be, you know, had its own problems that had nothing to do with Yoko. Uh, and even the White Album, she was there for an awful lot of stuff. Um, and I think, you know, to blame Yoko for the breakup of the Beatles when you have so many other things going on, like, you know, the, the financial problems Apple was having, the disputes that they were having about who should manage Apple, you know, whether the Eastmans or Klein or, you know, it, all of that stuff is just kind of petty. And to hold on to it after all these years is just silly. But, you know, also, Yoko, you know, really legitimately was part of that avant-garde scene. I mean, I've, I've um, researched the parts of it that were from before my time. I mean, going back to about 1960, she started a series of loft concerts in downtown New York, where a lot of composers who became pretty big composers – did some of their first performances. So even if, uh, apart from her own music, simply as a catalyst for other stuff going on, you know, she was there, she presented it, and she was part of that. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been to concerts where, concerts of that kind, you know, downtown in a loft, you know, heading into the 80s or 90s or early 2000s, where a work of hers would turn up now and then, you know, and it would be one of her instruction pieces where a card might get handed through the audience that says, you know, breathe or something, you know, some instruction, and then it would be handed to the next person. And, and so in a way, her performance, her, her work was being performed during the entire rest of the performance. And that's a thing about her avant-garde stuff. It's kind of humorous, you know, it's, it's not meant to be, you know, simply an intellectual pursuit. It's meant to make you smile. You know, mm. and uh, that in itself, you know, I mean, the older I get, the more I kind of realize that people who do things, particularly artworks and, uh, you know, statements that are meant to make you smile, that's actually a big thing. It's healthy for everyone. And uh, I, I just appreciate what she does. And that's all that stuff, the avant garde stuff. I mean, forgetting about the albums that she made from the time she met John going forward, which is a, a huge discography and um, lots of different kinds of things. I mean, the, the earliest stuff like Plastic Ono Band, uh, you know, that was sort of avant-garde jamming where, you know, her backup band is John on guitar, uh, Klaus Foreman on bass, Ringo on drums, and they're jamming and it's as if she's the electric guitar. You know, people think of it as screaming and screeching, fine. She's using her voice instrumentally and you know what? Go up to a mic and do it. It's not as easy as you might think and, uh, and especially doing it in an ensemble. Um, but that was one of those things that she could do. And uh, it may be kind of hard to deal with it first, but you, you listen to it, you get used to what's going on. There's some great stuff on those albums. And then she sort of, I think, uh, ultimately, you know, over time, segued into more conventional songwriting, which to me was a little less interesting than the avant-garde stuff. Uh, or, or at least so I thought until they put out that record, Every Man Has a Woman. Um, and other people did cover versions of those songs. And I began to realize, you know, these are actually pretty good songs. You know, um, you know, your people are, are perhaps um, not hearing it because uh, as a singer, as a conventional singer, her voice could be a little, you know, weak if you want Ella Fitzgerald or Janis Joplin, you know. But when you hear other people do the songs and other people think about, okay, I'm going to obviously do a different arrangement than Yoko. What are the implications of this song? How would a different arrangement work? How would a different vocal approach work? That album was really good. So I, I began to sort of rethink my feeling about her conventional songwriting. And for things like um, Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey, I, I thought her songs were quite strong. You know, not to mention something like Walk on Thin I Walking on Thin Ice, which was really just a brilliant record. So that's my overview. <laughs> huh. I don't really think there's anything to add to that. That was very well said, Alan. <laughs> Seriously. 
uh, really, in all seriousness, we're going to actually edit this section of the show out and uh, keep it as a Yoko Ono appreciation piece. Uh, now, her vocals, her vocal style, Alan, is, uh, especially if you're talking about the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album, uh, which everyone will say, oh, it's just her screaming. But it's actually based in a traditional uh, a Japanese style of, of uh, singing, is it not? Uh, yeah, I just tracked down where I was reading a little bit about uh, her vocalizations mixed, and I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm sure, hetai, a Japanese vocal technique from Kabuki Theater. <laughs> uh, and that blended with uh, the aggression of rock and roll and the primal therapy of sessions, of course, that she was go, uh, you know, going uh, under with, with John at the time. Try to uh, try to you know explain that style of singing that is on the Plastic Ono Band album. So let's uh, let's throw it over to you, Ken. Uh, and Alan has the classical background that you and I don't have, uh, and I think that's a necessary uh, background to have in trying to understand and appreciate what Yoko's uh, musical abilities uh, are influenced by and what they where they come from and what they're derived from your thoughts ken uh probably was introduced to yoko in almost a very similar way that i was uh on the music and her role in shaping john lennon the person and the artist yeah well first of all i think that um yoko has to be considered and i i know that some people will challenge me on this, the most influential person on John Lennon's life. Because to me, she not only influenced his music, she shaped him as a person mm -hmm. in a number of ways. But, um, you know, I was first introduced to Yoko when I was a little kid and, and hearing about her and hearing her voice for a few seconds on Revolution Number no. 9 and the continuing story of Bungalow Bill. And then, you know, from what I remember hearing, you know, the public treated her like she was very strange, you know, entering this whole new world of the Beatles and rock and roll. And I think still to this day, it's kind of ironic that 50 years plus later, there are a lot of people that don't understand Yoko at all. They don't understand her art. They don't understand why she was so important to John. But I think that she helped to introduce John to a whole other world other than the pop music world. And there's no doubt about it. John was influenced by a lot of music, a lot of pre-rock music, the 50s rock and roll that he loved. He was influenced by some of the music of the 60s that was going on as it was happening, like Bob Dylan. But Yoko was this whole other world altogether. In the avant-garde world and where she was coming from, anything goes there was this freedom that you can pretty much do anything some of her work is serious some of it is absurd and it's all treated as art and i think through yoko john saw this freedom and it liberated him and even though and this is probably the toughest thing for some of us to understand who don't really study yoko or the importance of what she meant to john even though the Beatles themselves made so much progress, album to album from the very beginning, they were growing creatively in leaps and bounds as songwriters and in terms of production, too. I think that John was the type of person, and a lot of geniuses are this way, that gets restless after a while. They always want something new. They always want to move on to the next thing. With Yoko, the sky's the limit. You could do anything you want. You can release an album with nothing but silence on it if you want, and it could be considered art. You can do songs where it's basically jamming. And it is true in a way, like, like you were saying, Alan, you know, if you've got the Plastic Ono Band album and you've got songs where, to a lot of people, that's screaming, how different is that than calling it vocal improvisation? How different is that than wailing away on the guitar for five minutes? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something that's so foreign to a rock fan's ears that they couldn't adjust to that. And Yoko is one of those people that one minute can put out something, you know, really commercial. You know, actually my, my favorite work of her still to this day, musically is her double album called approximately infinite universe. And there is a lot of rock and roll and ballads on there. And for its time, it seemed kind of strange. 
nowadays I listen to it, it seems it seems very mainstream. <laughs> but she put out an album like that, and then on our previous album, Fly, another double album, she'll put out some of her the vocal improvisation stuff. She'll put out something called Toilet Piece, which is nothing more than flushing a toilet <laughs> and the sound of that and the water going around in the toilet. And hand in hand, back and forth, there's serious work, there's silly work. There's anything she feels like doing. She made a lot of films with John that are considered avant-garde, free form. Mm -hmm. Some people will consider it boring. Some people find it interesting. You know, think about a film of just a close-up of John Lennon, a head shop, and it takes a long time before he smiles. And the name of the film is Smile. And you're just looking at John for a long period of time. And that's the whole film. <laughs> and then there's another film called Erection, which is not what people think. But it was the erection of a building, what became the hotel. And you see it over time. And it could be several days before the, the hotel is finished. But to some people, they find that interesting, fascinating. Some people call it boring. So we were talking, Alan, about um, this John Cage piece, which is uh, over four minutes of just silence. And people went and saw this performance, sat in their seats, and there was nothing but silence for four minutes and 33 seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, to some people, there's art in that. There's some value there. Yeah. To some people, this is all a farce. Well, what is it? You know, well, yeah. And, you know, and, and that's actually, um, it's the kind of piece that would have appealed really to Yoko. I, I've seen it performed many times. I mean, it, it wasn't done just once. It's done all the time. I've seen people offer it as encores after like a cello recital. You know, the cellist would come out and sit down. And within about four seconds, you know that he's doing four minutes 33. Um, huh. Because four minutes 33 is actually a three movement piece each movement with specific timings, but the whole point of it, which is, you know, it's obviously very cagey and it's his thing, but it's, it's so related to the kind of thing Yoko would do. It was written for a concert hall up in Woodstock and the concert hall had open sides. And the idea was that the night that this was having its premiere, what you're listening to is not the silence of the pianist not playing it. What you're hearing is all of the other sound that's happening outside, all the bugs and the birds and the, the noises. You're, you're focusing on that silence and hearing that it's not really silence at all. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Yoko picked up on from Cage, too. You know, the idea of, you know, when she hands out a card that says breathe – you know, you can just breathe, but you can also kind of think about what she's asking and, and, and what to listen to when you're breathing. And that's what Cage wanted. And I think for a piece like that, that's what Yoko wanted, too. There's yeah, more going thinking, on than meets the eye. You know? <laughs> I was thinking the same thing, because even if you're in an auditorium where you've got four minutes of silence, Mm -hmm. It's not just silence. Right. You might hear the squeak of a chair or something. And is that part of the piece then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Yoko was also really, uh, I'm not going to say she was the first to do this. I'm sure she was maybe among the first. But when you talk about something like she would have a telephone that was mounted on a wall and the phone would ring and a person would pick it up and she'd be on the other end mm -hmm. and they would have a conversation. Now, to some people, what talent does it take for that? But that's considered an art piece. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interactive. And I was trying to get, get across this message of doing interactive art, which is so big these days. Right. So, you know, she opened up John's mind to all these things. And I'm sure that John, in fact, John said that Part of the appeal in Yoko was that he didn't understand everything she was doing. And he was very curious about all this art. And he fully backed her up on mm -hmm. everything that she did, whether it was her recordings on Apple or all the art shows that she put on that he was involved with, too. And it was a whole new world for him. Mm -hmm. So imagine going from a rock world where there are certain expectations that come with every single album. You've got to have so many songs. You've got to have a hit single from this. 
a Beatles album has to have mainly John and Paul songs with a couple of George songs and one Ringo song. And that's formula, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's a great formula while it's working. But with Yoko, you can break every rule that you want, and it's still considered art. Mm -hmm. You can put out something commercial. You can put out silence. You can put out a baby's heartbeat going on for several minutes and stopping. And somehow that's considered art. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say somehow, but to some people, they find this stuff interesting. Sure. You know, uh, we can go back and forth and argue as to whether something is artistic or not, or a form of art. There are people that actually find something in listening to an album like Two Virgins or Life with the Lions or George Harrison's Electronic Sound. Mm -hmm. You know, is it art or is it not? You can debate this back and forth. And I think the important thing that Yoko brought to our culture because of the fact that she'd been doing this already, but she was in this much bigger forum now being the girlfriend and then the wife of one of the biggest names in the world. She brought this to the attention of a massive audience. And some people thought she was crazy. Some people got what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And there are still people to this day who don't understand her right. talent. Sure. And no matter how many times you try to convince certain people, there are people who don't understand her. And worse yet, there are people who just don't want to understand her. Mm -hmm. And if you care enough about John, you don't have to necessarily love her work, but you have to understand why she was important to John in this regard. Mm -hmm. And the mere fact that he did so many things with her and we all know that they didn't have a perfect marriage. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been that separation the last weekend. But they still did so many things together. They worked side by side on some time in New York City with songs going back and forth. And then they did the same thing with Double Fantasy. They had plans of, of uh, working on Milk and Honey. They had plans of touring together. John made these decisions with Yoko. It was important enough to do these things with Yoko she was his soulmate, and she was someone who wasn't just a wife to him, but she was that important that he wanted to share his art at times with her and expose her to the world. And he was very gung-ho about walking on thin ice, saying that it was going to be a number one hit for her. Mm -hmm. He believed in her that much. And um, I just think that she was such an eye-opener to John, whether you like her work or not. You have to respect the fact that this is what John appreciated. This was the new thing for him. And yes, it, it added something that they got married and there was more to their relationship than just the artistic side. And of course, they had Sean together. But, um, you know, she, was, she became the single most important person in John's life. And it went beyond the music. I do believe that when it came to the music, and it's often been said this about Yoko, that John's lyrics became more personal. Mm -hmm. uh, it became autobiographical at times, you know, and you have to question. I'm not going to say it's because of Yoko that we have a Plastic Ono Band album, but I'm sure she was some influence in that, you know. Mm -hmm. So much of what they did together with the peace movement was because she was with John. Whether it was all her idea or they shared it together, somehow I can't imagine if John had met any other woman or married any other woman, there would have been bed ends for peace. Well, or, I don't know. Maybe if it was Jane Fonda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. One in, one in a million <laughs> there. But, uh, or doing all that they did together for peace or to be so politically active. You know, I just uh, I can't see if he stayed with Cynthia that that would have happened. So you got to give Yoko a lot of credit in that department, because all the decisions that they made together, they collaborated on things together. Mm -hmm. You know, and we all know now, although some fans will vehemently deny it, that she was an influence on the song Imagine, since she now has co-writing credit because of her poetry in the, in the book Grapefruit. Mm -hmm. being taken from that. Yeah. You know, if you watch the Above Us Only Sky documentary, you'll see the two of them talking to each other, sharing ideas about one of the songs on the sessions. They work together as a team. Mm -hmm. 
And John thought highly enough of her to trust her judgment and to take her ideas. So, and I think one other thing that's really important, and, and for all the people who have trouble trying to understand about the Beatle breakup, for people who think that she took him away from the I think what she did was, John was a very insecure guy in a lot of ways, when he would say how Paul would write so many songs all at once, mm-hmm. you know, and he felt the competition with Paul there. Yoko made John feel that, you know, he was great completely by himself. That's not, that doesn't mean that she wanted him away from the Beatles, but she gave him the confidence to believe in himself so that he can do the things he wanted to do on his own. Mm-hmm. He yeah. also just needed things shaken up at that point in his life. I, I, I'm hesitant to say, you know, what would have or wouldn't have happened if he stayed together with Cynthia. But Cynthia herself said that, you know, towards the end of their marriage, he was sort of just doing acid all the time. And um, she actually said that she blamed that for the breakup um, of, of their marriage more than Yoko. And I think that he had gotten himself into this kind of torpor, you know? He was just like introspective and doing drugs and just sort of like inside himself. And Yoko, I think, came along and just, you know, in a way shocked the hell out of him, you know, just seeing that there was this kind of art that she was doing just sort of woke him up and and, and said, hey, you know, this is a whole other world out there that I haven't done anything about yet. Maybe I should. Mm. Yeah. He needed something new. And with Yoko, I mean, like I said, there was a total freedom there. It's a different world than what he was involved with then, with the Beatles, even with all the freedom that the Beatles had creatively. Mm-hmm. So, Darren, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying listening uh, <laughs> also to what you uh, added, Ken. And to be honest with you, my opinions are pretty much what the two of you said on Yoko's role in John's life and as an influence, I too uh, always uh, felt, again, at the time, if you were following the Beatles, uh, if you were a dedicated fan in the 60s, following them as with each single and with each album and with each tour, maybe it wasn't as obvious then. But looking back now, knowing what we know now, you look back and you know that John was a, a very artistic individual who wrote wrote poetry. He published the two books, uh, A Spaniard in the Works, and uh, before that it was um, in his own right. There's uh, the, the drawings that also were done. John was had a lot of things going on swimming around in his head, and uh, the whole idea of being a beetle got boring. Of course, it was claustrophobic early on uh, when they were le- had to lead very sheltered lives as beetles, and uh, go from a recording studio to a concert stage, back to the recording studio, to a movie set, back to the recording studio, back to the concert stage. And it got a little uh, monotonous. And then along comes Yoko, who basically takes this restless artist and this multifaceted talent and tells him there is no rules. Anything can go. You don't have to play the guitar and play the set chords that are... Uh, that you know and that are written down because this, music is art and anything goes in art. Everything is okay. She not only opened doors for John, she opened the windows as well. And and I think that freedom that, um, that she uh, made John aware of is similar to George finding uh, Indian music and John also, uh, George also having his eyes opened in a spiritual way. The spirituality that George found comfort in and his love of Indian music mirrored the fact that uh, it mirrored what John, you know, discovered once Yoko was in his life and that it was okay to basically do anything that you seem that seems exciting and interesting to you at the time. Uh, And that's where Yoko's role, which echoes basically what both of you said about about. And, uh, of course, the common thing, she broke up the Beatles. And I remember when I was younger hearing also that Linda was, you know, also responsible for breaking up the Beatles. Well, that was all timing and that was all what you saw in the photos. So Linda was new in the picture. 
Yoko Ono was new in the picture. What was happening at that time? The Beatles weren't getting along. They were having business issues. They were having uh, issues with management and financial problems, which isn't what you saw in the newspapers or in the photos. It's what you saw. The, what you did see were the wives, the girlfriends in the picture now. So let's blame Yoko. Let's blame Linda also for being responsible for breaking up the Beatles. Well, it, you know, that's asinine. You know, there were many layers to the onion, which was the breakup of the Beatles. And um, for Yoko to be blamed for breaking up the Beatles is ridiculous. It's that Yoko just showed John all of these ideas that you have bottled up can come out. It could come out any way you want it to. It doesn't have to come out in a, a rock and roll song. And uh, and John took that idea and ran with it. And, uh, you know, we're talking strictly Yoko's music. I mean, we have uh, artists. We talked about John Cage already. Uh, then there is uh, the electronic group White Noise uh, and, and their iconic album, An Electric Storm. There's jazz musician Ornette Coleman. There's the band Sonic Youth. There was some of the abrasive stuff that the Velvet Underground did. Yoko by no means was unique when it came to doing music that was avant-garde and different and kind of left of center. Happened all the time. You know, so beating up and coming down on Yoko is is just, in my book, ignorance. And she worked with Ornette uh, Coleman, but, too. Yeah, the uh, on, on the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album, there is a, uh, a piece called AOS, <laughs> which actually was... I don't know if it was the Ornette Coleman performance that Yoko was part of or the other way around, but it was uh, recorded uh, in early 1968. Uh, in fact, the anniversary of its recording uh, is uh, coming up uh, this weekend, February 29th, 1968. The performance took place, which resulted in AOS on the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album. And um, I mean, February 1968, John and Yoko had met each other. At that point, and the relationship was brewing, but by no means were they a uh, an a, 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 an item that was in the media. I don't think. Mm -hmm. And Yoko was uh, embracing and, and partaking in music and doing things that uh, I think John might have been hesitant to do at that point. But by the end of the year, we had two virgins. You could see the impact that Yoko had on John, the artist. And it didn't stop John from still coming out uh, with things like Come Together and Instant Karma and these great songs, Imagine and Jealous Guy, that we would go on to enjoy in the years to come. It was just another layer to what John was. And Yoko, you know, woke it up. But I really can't add any more substance on top of what the two of you have already pointed out, because I completely and utterly agree. I have actually found, I don't think comfort's the right word, but I've actually uh, found myself relating to certain albums of Yoko's. And I always point out that in the aftermath of 9-11, I went down to Strawberry Fields on October 9th, 2001. Just, you know, what is it? We talked after, after the 9-11 uh, attacks, smelling the uh, horrors in the air. And when I left Strawberry Fields that night, I don't recall if I was there alone or with people. I got in my car and just decided to drive south and to see how far I could go close to ground zero I could get. And it just so happened that uh, I had a copy of Yoko's album Blueprint for a Sunrise in the car with me. I think it was in advance because I don't think the album was out yet. And I had gotten an advanced copy of the CD and I was listening to it and something about that album that night driving down to lower Manhattan just to see what would happen. It resonated with me. Uh, and I don't think uh, I think it was a perfect storm. I don't think there was any other recording I could have been listening to that just jived with the mood at that time. Me in my car by myself heading down. Uh, yeah, the album came out in November 2001. So it wasn't out yet. I had an advance uh, with me in the car. And that night I actually somehow drove and got out of the car across the street from uh, the smoldering remains of 
of the towers and uh, was it was left alone and stood there and looked and watched uh, as the workers were on the pile for about 10 minutes till a, a policeman came over and was like, what are you doing here? And then going home with what I had seen and what I had experienced listening to Blueprint for a Sunrise. I mm. couldn't tell you now what it was about the music, but it, it what she did on that album jived with me and where my head was at <laughs> that October 9th to October 10th, 2001. So more power to you, Yoko, and, uh, and a belated happy birthday from us here uh, at Things We Said Today. Now, we have a few minutes remaining in the program, and it goes without saying that we have another very important birthday upon us. In fact, as we record this show, we are acknowledging and celebrating George Harrison's 77th birthday. We know that George was born on February 25th, but at some point, somebody realized that it's possible that George's birth was actually before midnight, making his birthday February 24th. Now, I never completely got that story straight because I heard, you know, two different sides to, yes, he did, in fact, w was born before midnight or no, that's a fairy tale. So as I said at the top of the show, we, I celebrate 48 hours of George Harrison. And we thought going into the show that once we were done discussing Yoko, let's uh, just take a quick few minutes to uh, talk about, um, you know, a song or in my case, maybe for you guys, uh, your, for you as well, an album that is the one that we go to when it's time to put on some George Harrison at home. And... Again, alphabetically, let's start off with uh, with Alan. Okay. I don't really have a George Harrison album that I go to. It's I mean, they're all very different, and there's something I like about all of them. And so depending on what mood I'm in, I'm going to pick one or the other, or, you know, unpredictably. But so when we said we would do this, I looked at the shelf, and I sort of was drawn to Cloud Nine. And I guess... The reason it, it's Cloud Nine rather than All Things Must Pass, which you know could equally be my favorite George Harrison album, or or really any of them, uh, is just that you know he had stopped recording for a few years. Um, I think he was kind of you know had enough of the music business, and um, for reasons that one can understand, when you know he has an album turned back to him and is asked to replace some songs and then responds with a song like blood from a clone, which criticizes the music industry for the very kind of expectations that it, it was, you know, asking him to fulfill. So he takes a few years off, come back and does cloud nine and cloud nine has a very kind of modern sound to it. It has a very contemporary, tough sound, you know, it's it, far more than his earlier albums, which are, you know, of their period and, you know, sounded fine at the time and they still sound fine. But Cloud Nine just seems more modern sounding to me. And it's a great collection of songs. One cover, Got My Mind Set On You, was, was the big hit. But, you know, these are... There's not a bad song on here, and you know there are things like when we we when we was fab, you know, which has captures that whole Beatley thing in a kind of slightly sarcastic way that was totally George, you know, Devil's Radio about gossip. I mean, you know, he's he had his point of view that he wanted to get across, and uh, and he did it. Uh, fish on the sand this is love i mean it's it's really all great stuff and it's it's a great list and start to finish so that's why in this particular case i reached for that one hmm. okay so uh cloud nine for uh from alan and for ken well i've got to give you two different answers uh, the reason being because i've often said living in the material world is my favorite album of all time from any artist it's such an essential album for me because I find it deeply personal on George's in terms of what George was going through at the time. It was kind of his plastic on old band in a way, lyrically. That's how I kind of look at it. I love the spiritual side of George and certain songs like Be Here Now and The Light That Has Lighted the World are so powerful 
in its message and in what it's saying. Who can see it as another song just like that? So in terms of importance to me, that album has to come number one. But as far as if I was just running off and I was going to go for a drive or go away on vacation and I had to pick a George Harrison album, I would pick Cloud Nine. Something like Living in the Material World I'd want to listen to when I'm at home and I'm seriously going to listen to it. It's not going to be background for me. I'm going to be listening to every nuance of each song and listen to the lyrics and the production of it and everything that was put into it. Cloud Nine I could listen to in the background. I could put it on the car. It doesn't really matter that much to me whether it sounds contemporary or not. The songs are what matter the most. But I love some of the lightheartedness on uh, Cloud Nine, like Wreck of the Hespers, for example, and Got My Mind Set on You and When We Was Fab. But uh, when you've got a couple of songs back to back, like um, that's what it takes going into Fish on the Sand, you can't, you, you can't, it's those are two killer songs that work so well together. You know, I love everything about Cloud Nine. Uh, so that would be like a go to album if I was in a hurry and I had to grab something and listen in the car. But for a serious listen, I would pick Living in the Material World. All right. So we have uh, Cloud Nine for Alan. Ken, Living in the Material World, and Cloud Nine, depending on the position of the planets. <laughs> and for me, 33 and a Third is my pick. Mm -hmm. um, 33 and a Third was my first George Harrison album. It was the first album I definitely owned when, it, you know, the first current album that I owned coming out in 1976 when I was 11 and probably, not probably, quite possibly Christmas of that year getting 33 and a third. And then after that, you know, all things must pass. And uh, eventually the George Harrison record came out in 79. I remember getting that for my 14th birthday. But 33 and a third for me, pound for pound, is Harrison's best album. Now, I know that the All Things Must Pass fans are going to come at me. And I'm not arguing that All Things Must Pass is the most important George Harrison album and quite possibly the best. But when it comes to a concise 10 song album from the first note to the last note, uh, 33 and a third for me is Harrison Perfection. And it's uh, a bit of an American sounding album. George had some uh, great uh, American players with him on, the, on those sessions. Tom Scott playing sax, uh, Richard T, the late great Richard T, longtime Paul Simon keyboard player, Willie Weeks, who many years later many years later, but some years later, briefly, was in the Doobie Brothers. Willie Weeks, a great bass player on bass. No, on ukulele, Darren. Of course he'd be on bass. Uh, Billy Preston's there. Even David Foster, uh, being a Chicago fan, David Foster, the guy who initially saved Chicago and then killed Chicago. That's a debate <laughs> for another show. Um, Gary Wright's there. Great players, and it's just... It's an, it, it just sounds Americanized, uh, uh, that album. Very funky, very soulful, dare I say even occasionally jazzy. One of, you know, Harrison's great songs, cover songs, True Love, the Cold mm -hmm. Water tune is here. Two of my favorite hits. They weren't enormous hits, but they were very popular songs in 76, I remember. Cracker Box Palace and this song. You really get a sense and get to enjoy the Monty Python-esque humor uh, coming through on those two songs. And what should have been the third single off the album and would have been a big hit, Beautiful Girl. And Beautiful Girl and Woman Don't You Cry For Me are connected to the All Things Must Pass era. Because they were both songs that George wrote ballpark in that time, time frame. And... Um, I think they both were demoed uh, for All Things Must Pass and didn't get too far. I think they, they were both demoed, correct? Well, Woman, Don't You Cry For Me, there is that early version on Early Takes Volume 1, which right. I'm guessing, because they don't actually, they don't have the dates on those recordings on mm -hmm. Early Takes, but I'm guessing that it's from the All Things It Must is from period. that time. I just didn't know if it was, if George cut like the demo, say on Early Takes at the same time that he was putting together other songs for All Things Must Pass. The Beware of Apco, I believe, uh, boot, 
if I, it's been a long time since I've been a, listened to that uh, bootleg Beware of Abco. But if I'm not mistaken, the demo of Beautiful Girl is on that. <laughs> you know, so uh, I think you're correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so there's two songs that take us back to All Things Must Pass, present on 33 and a third. So for me, those 10 songs... Uh, pound for pound, as I always say, All Things Must Pass does have the apple jam at the end of it that weighs it down a little. And when I listen to an album, I try to listen to the whole thing from beginning to end. If you took All Things Must Pass and crushed it into 10 songs, 33 and a third. And often I think 33 and a third would be an album I would take with me onto a desert island. So, uh, And this weekend, it was the album I listened to numerous times uh, in my own little personal George Harrison fest that I had in my house um, <laughs> in anticipation of George's birthday. Uh, he would have been 77. By the time you listen to the show, the birthday will have passed. His birthday will have passed by a couple of days. And, uh, and that basically, I think, brings us to the close of another edition of Things We Said Today, uh, remembering George Harrison and uh, taking a look at uh, the role that Yoko Ono has played in the Beatles story, in John Lennon's life, and in the art world uh, in general. So let's go around uh, the horn and uh, get our contact information and share any other tidbits that we might want to share, uh, starting with you, Alan. Okay, so the best way to get in touch with me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can also contact all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed at things we said fab and a Facebook page, things we said today Beatles radio fans. All right, over to you, Ken. All right, a couple things. First of all, Beautiful Girl is part of Beware of Abco. And since you. You mentioned, since you mentioned David Foster, you didn't mention that he worked with Paul McCartney, too. But uh, on Flowers in the Dirt. On Flowers for, in the Dirt, yeah. Well, when I say, and of course, he was part of the band Attitudes that recorded yep. for Dark Horse Records and actually did uh, work with Yes early on. I'm sorry, I just can't. I can't just forgive him for pushing the horns into the back burner on Chicago's 80s material and bringing electric drums in. But again, that's for the Chicago podcast. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Earlier, Darren, you were talking about my show, Every Little Thing. There is a syndicated show called Every Little Thing, which is a one-hour show, which is a mixture of Beatle and solo Beatle music and anything Beatle-related, whether it's cover versions, side projects, tribute songs, you name it. Every show has a thematic set that closes the show. And on my website, there is a page for Every Little Thing which lists all the radio stations that carry the show and when they broadcast it with links to their website so you can stream them. Also, if they're heard on other platforms like TuneIn, for example, or Alexa. And then there's my live broadcast of Every Little Thing, which is completely separate from the syndicated show. Isn't this confusing? It's on Wednesday nights on WNHU in West Haven, Connecticut at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can stream that at WNHU.org. My uh, other podcast show called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, happens every other Monday night. And so the next show that we'll be doing will actually be on March the 2nd. And that's at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And um, we're going to be talking about the first three singles that John Lennon launched his career with, those being Give Peace a Chance, Cold Turkey, and Instant Karma. Talking about those singles, that will be our main topic. It's all about the solo Beatles for the most part, and you can join me with Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Mean Mr. Mayo. Those are all my other co-hosts for the show, and that show also gets uh, posted on YouTube. It stays on our Facebook page, and you can also get just the audio portion of that on YouTube, on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes. It's all over the place. And also on my website, one thing, 
I do have a trivia uh, question or a Beatle game every single week, and I'm now giving away the new uh, Ultimate Edition 50th Anniversary Blu-ray for Harry Nilsson's The Point, which was narrated by Ringo Starr. There's actually several versions of The Point, because when it was first uh, broadcast on television, Dustin Hoffman was the narrator. But for all the video releases that have come out on the point, Ringo is the narrator. That's the one that I'm giving away as one of nine prizes on my website, which is at KenMichaelsRadio.com. So be sure to check that out. And that's about it. Back to you, Darren. All right. Uh, and um, I can be reached at uh, w, my WFUV email address, which is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org, you know, and, and, and when we were talking earlier on about John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds, I was thinking that I should actually use that as my uh, explanation of why maybe there might be dead air on my show someday. If, if you know, my management comes to me and go, what was going on? I could always say, well, you know, I was performing John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds. It wasn't dead air. It was... Okay. Or you could say if it's less than four minutes and 33 seconds, you were doing your longer version of the Newtopian National Anthem. That's right. You can also cut all of that out. I'll say it again. <laughs> or two minutes silence from Life with the Lions. Yeah, all right. Uh, my contact information, if you want to shoot me an email, you can write me at WFUV. Uh, the address is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, and Darren DeVivo is D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. Uh, or go to Facebook and like my radio page, my broadcasting page, whatever you want to call it. It's Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That's the full name of the page where you could uh, click like and we'll be connected there. And uh, we can mess in, you know, messenger back and forth and post things back and forth and whatnot. And uh, you can catch me on the radio on WFUV Monday through and uh, Monday through Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. So that's four nights a week. And in addition to that, on weekends, WFUV has a second channel, which is called FUV Music. Now I'm on the uh, on the air there for 36 hours from noon. That's yes, 36 hours. From noon on Saturday afternoons to midnight Sunday nights. Now, how you pick all of this up? New York City metropolitan area during the week. For my weeknight shows, you could either listen to 90.7 FM or listen on 90.7 FM HD2. The weekend FUV music 36-hour extravaganza is only on 90.7 FM HD2. Just HD. Everything can be heard on our website wfuv.org and same thing with the wfuv app so uh that's my story and i'm sticking to it and for alan cozen and ken michaels i'm darren devivo thank you for listening to another edition of things we said today uh remembering george harrison and a belated happy birthday to yoko ono thanks for listening everyone mm-hmm.